So I am uh, Josh Mitchell. I am the IT Enterprise and Web Applications Manager for Multnomah County. I have one of the longest titles at the county, and I pride myself in that. Uh, my, for my team, I'm known as the Balrog, which I consider a uh, polite and uh, reverential title for someone who plays the role of benign dictator. I get to be the, uh, the decider. Um, I'm going to walk you guys through one of our biggest projects that we did over the past year on roughly February 6th-ish, I believe it was. No, 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 it was February 29th. That's right, we did it on the 29th because then it could only happen once every four years. On February 29th, we went uh, completely public with the new Multnomah County Library public website. And so I'm going to talk to you about some of the open source tools that we used to build that, a little bit about our production and platform process and methodology, um, and also just a, you know, kind of a few cool stats about the library here and there. So first thing I'm going to do is talk a little bit about uh, what we have set up at the county. And uh, it's something that we're, we're pretty proud of. We're, we pride ourselves in taking the long view. Um, Whenever I arrived at the county, I was told that my web platform was vignette, and it wasn't changing. And the last CIO had died on her sword to make sure that a vignette project went through. And for those of you who have used vignette, um, you can imagine my consternation about that, because it's not a very user-friendly tool. It's not a very developer-friendly tool. We've been going for about a year or so with a uh, public website redesign for the, the county as a whole using Vignette. And I think we had, we'd migrated something like six sites. Um, six months later, I think we had migrated two more sites. And I was like, please, just let me move the thing over to Drupal. I guarantee we can improve our pace. Um, and that kind of kicked off a series of events. Uh, I, I was actually brought into the county with an open source bent. Um, my title even had open source kind of tacked on to the end of it. And I told him to take it off because really, we should be looking at open source across all of our lines of business and not just the ones that are under mine. Um, and they did, and we are. And we're really trying to take, a, take that to heart as much as possible. The other thing that we're really getting involved with is using cloud computing. Um, the entire platform that I'm going to be describing to you is actually hosted on the Amazon cloud, uh, which love it or hate it, um, it gives us a lot of flexibility and it allowed us to do a lot of things very quickly. So a few of the technologies I'm going to be talking about today um, obviously, the big Drupal, uh, DrupalCon there. Uh, Drupal has been a big part of what we've been able to achieve. Uh, it's given us the flexibility to have a platform to build off of that allows us to do a lot of cool things. Um, Amazon Web Services have been critical to that as well because of the speed and flexibility. Uh, maybe a couple lesser known ones. Uh, Nginx um, is an HTTP server alternative to Apache that's a little bit lighter weight and does some caching and performance improvements. I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, Varnish, uh, which is also caching. Um, we like to cache, cache, and cache again, and I'll mention that again later. Um, Apache Solar, which is a pretty powerful search uh, index and searching tool that you can kind of integrate in with a Drupal site very easily and do some really powerful things. So those are a few of the technologies we'll talk about, and I'll talk about a couple more in depth here as we go along. Uh, when we started moving things to Amazon, um, I really love the moniker of use only what you need. Um, that's how we've managed to save a lot of money, is we only spin it up when we actually need it. Uh, you don't actually need to spin up that production server or even buy that production server until you get to the point that you're ready to launch production. So uh, that's been a big part of our process. And that looks like the most uncomfortable bench that you could ever sit on. Uh, but it's been a very comfortable place to be in. Amazon Web Services, uh, obviously the pay-as-you-go piece is big. Uh, scalability is big. It gives you a lot of options for doing like Elastic Cloud and those sorts of things. Um, simple storage, uh, we've used the heck out of it um, to try to take some of the load off of our web servers and put them out into a highly redundant space that has a really good storage model. Uh, relational database service is their fancy way of talking about MySQL servers. And it's a managed MySQL environment so that you don't have to spend a lot of time doing MySQL optimization. That was really important for our team when we started out because we started out with a single DevOps person. Um, we now have two DevOps guys. Um, and when you see how many sites we've launched with just those two DevOps guys, you can see where I would try to cut every corner I can on making them have to manage or support something. And so that's been a good way for us to kind of roll out a really stable, uh, performant MySQL environment without investing a lot of money or time. Um, the solutions are kind of ready to go. When we first launched the project, I went out and uh, fired up an Amazon instance that actually had Drupal already installed, that had 
half of our optimizations already installed, and that was our pilot server. And I didn't have to build it because I could rely on a, a, a great group called Elastic um, that was building images at that time that was perfect for our need. You can do this a lot with Amazon, so it's a great kind of place to kind of spin up and quickly test things, and it's been a big part of what we do. We've, we've spun up and test several open source projects on like an Amazon Micro or an Amazon Small, and we shut it down, and we've spent like 100 bucks to test something. In some cases, we've spent five bucks to test something. Um, and that kind of flexibility and that model is great. And I also want to extend out that it's great for small shops because you don't have to invest a lot of money or time or hardware. Um, so get involved in that. Use that as an opportunity to fire up your own open source projects um, and use that as a way to you know, talk to the higher ups and convince them that it's worth trying because it's not really going to cost them any money for you to try it. So Drupal. I am a huge fan of Drupal. I've been a fan of Drupal since before I was at the county. Um, I, actually, before I was at the county, I worked for a digital marketing agency here in Portland. And we did a couple of really cool sites. Uh, we did a Hitachi product site. Uh, we built the member website for the Grammys. Uh, we were actually the ones who introduced Drupal to the Grammys. And then uh, a few years later, Lullabot actually took and moved their uh, production website for the Grammy night event, which has to scale in phenomenal ways. And if you're ever interested in hearing about that, you get a whole talk from Kevin Colligan, who's their uh, director of uh, media something or another. He's got a great title, but he's also a great guy and, and shares a lot of information. But they do an amazing amount of scaling in a, in a one-time space. And Drupal works for that all the way down to kind of the small community-driven sites. It's got a lot of great tools for running a community-driven site. More than that, it's also an excellent content management framework. I like to say think Legos when you think of, of, of Drupal because it, it's really, you know, I grab this Lego that has this particular shape and I stack it on with this Lego that has this particular shape and before long I have a car. Now, if I built it from scratch, I could have built a much better car, but it would have taken me 10 times as long to do. And so you're very much standing on the shoulder of giants. You're using other people's code. Uh, you're using what they've done that works well. And hopefully, you're contributing back to that as well, which I think is an important part of the open source community. Um, it's used on all kinds of projects. Uh, Whitehouse.gov is one of the other really big websites on Drupal right now. Georgia.gov just moved over to it in the last year. Um, I actually lost out to presenting at DrupalCon just a couple weeks ago because some Whitehouse.gov guy wanted to talk, and I still harbor a small grudge about that. Um, Portland is a hub of Drupal activity. Besides DrupalCon, uh, we've got several great Drupal shops in town that are doing some amazing thing, including a branch of Acquia that's kind of one of the big care and feeding companies for Drupal, uh, but also Open Sorcery, Metal Toad. Um, I could throw out ThinkShout. I could throw out lots of, of names of kind of small, either boutique or a little bit bigger type agencies that are doing some really cool work with Drupal in Portland, which is uh, it's nice for them to be kind of in a circle because we can bounce ideas off of each other and do some kind of cool things with that. Um, so what have we done with Drupal? You guys are you're like, when is he going to get the library? I'm going to get there. Don't worry. I've got like 45 minutes, and you hear how fast I talk. So three years, this is what we've launched with Drupal, um, about three years, because we didn't get to do it the first six months I was there. It's been about three and a half years. So I'm going to say about three years. We've launched a new public website, new library website, a new animal services website. Uh, we've migrated the Multco Food Initiative over onto our platform. We built a new intranet that is a complete social intranet that actually allows people to do things like comment and create their own groups. And literally every single county employee can fire up their own group and start collaborating. It's pretty awesome. Uh, we've also done a GIS database tracker where all, where all of our GIS, eh, GIS uh, graphical information system databases can be tracked. In a, in a common database, and you can kind of see the metadata we have about those da databases and see if you want to use one. Uh, we track a lot of our building projects uh, through a little Drupal application that was created. We, cr we actually track every single one of our applications and all of the server hardware and all the databases. We track that on a Drupal installation, and it holds our change management database right now, which is pretty impressive. Um, we have Chartroom is like a little healthcare application. It doesn't actually store uh, HIPAA data in it, but it has pointers to tell people where certain things are on the shelf. Uh, we have an accounting program that we put together on Drupal. By the way, never build an accounting program on Drupal. That's one of the ones I'll say was a bad idea. 
Um, that product took way too long to get out the door, and it's not that great after. Um, but uh, we built one of those on there. We uh, have a mental health and addiction services database that uh, tracks uh, uh, DUI offenders over a period of time and to make sure that they're going back and uh, getting help for their need. Uh, we have one of the scariest sites you will ever see, Public Sex Offender Registry. Man, I hate looking at that site. Every time something happens and we have to do an update and you have to go regression test it, those guys just look scary. Mug shots are no fun. Uh, the event planner for the library programs, I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in just a little bit. And this is one of my favorite. We did a library art inventory. Um, they needed to inventory every piece of art as a part of the district change that is occurring uh, after the vote this year. And there's about 250 pieces of art or whatnot across the dif different uh, libraries that have been donated over time, and they're a part of this public uh, collection. I think we even have a, a, a Renoir. Go figure. Um, so this is an inventory that we need to take for insurance purposes and also just to know where these things are in the system. And uh, they came to us and they were like, well, we're, we're going to take this Fox Pro database and copy it over and build off of that. And I'm like, no, you're not. I was like, give us a couple hours. And uh, I grabbed a, one of our developers and one of our designers and we sat in a room and we built an art inventory application in about eight total hours. So it was about three, two to three hours of us sitting in a room, a couple of hours of us tweaking it after the fact, a couple hours for our DevOps guy to set up the server. Up and running. Beautiful. Love that. You can't do that with too many platforms out there. And if you ever need to build a quick content management solution, Drupal can often be a starting point. You then have to maintain it after you've built it. Our engineering process and platform, um, this is a really high level summation of it, but if you wanted to go in more detail or ask me questions about it, feel free. Uh, we do have an Ubuntu build that we use every time that we're pretty comfortable with this at, at this point. Um, it's kind of interesting how we have it set up on Amazon. We have elastic block storage, which is just kind of a way of saying a disk share. Uh, we have the OS separated from the database, which is actually on that RDS layer. Um, separated from the file system. Um, so if we're not putting the file system on S3, we actually still have it separated out from our operating system layer, and it gives us a lot of flexibility. It makes it really easy for us to do snapshots and backups and that sort of thing. We use Apache on most of our Drupal instances, though when I'm talking about the library site today, the way that we use it is a, we kinda use it. We use it on the way down a chain. Uh, we use MySQL very heavily, which I've talked about, uh, PHP, and our DevOps guys add a little secret sauce. Um, I say it's love. Um, mo <laughs> our environment looks like multiple local devs, so all of us have our own separate local dev environment. <laughs> I say us as if I'm allowed to develop. Um, we all have our own separate local dev environment. Uh, we contribute code to that. It gets uh, pushed and pulled up the chain. We're actually using Git. Um, our Git environment is... It's taken a lot of uh, different paths over the last uh, last two years, especially in terms of how we've, we've structured it. But what it looks like right now is your dev environment, you're mostly pulling. You check it in into our remote master branch under your dev branch, and then we have our DevOps guys uh, do a basically build master role, and they cherry pick um, all the commits that you tell them to cherry pick into either our test branch or our production branch. And it kind of makes it up, up the chain like that. When it goes to production, uh, one of the cool things that we have set up is an SFTP deployment process so that it uses a service account, kind of a lockdown service account that has access to the, uh, um, it's also locked down by IP, and we just kind of push that code right in there, which means that we don't have our, our .get files or any of our other kind of development cruft sitting on our production server. It is a pristine place where um, only the, the best code goes to live. Kind of like an old folks home, only not so much. So the library website, that's why you guys came here, right? Yeah. Okay, let me talk a little bit about it. Uh, the library website is busy. It's about 23,000 visits per day. Uh, that's not unique visitors, that's visits. Um, and we don't necessarily count unique visitors because, um, well, lots of people use the library website in the library and they all look the same in the library because they're all on the same IP. So. Uh, visits is a better uh, way for us to track. Librarians are rock stars, tattoos and all. I, I, my neighbor and library friend, um, known her for a better part of eight years now, she has this awesome forearm tattoo that says, fear no question. She's a reference librarian. I just love that. Um, 
our, our marketing director is tatted all the way down his arms. It's, it's, it's really pretty awesome how many tattoos exist in the library, and not just on the people who visit. It is Portland, after all. Um, it's, it's got some cool stuff. It's got an integrated site and catalog search, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail. We uh, publish and plan, or we plan first and then publish, because if you did it the other way around, things would break. Um, we publish about 800 events per month across our 19 branches. That's pretty phenomenal, and I'll kind of go into a little bit what that process looks like and uh, how we managed to pull that off. Um, we've uh, implemented everything with a responsive design, very much uh, with the moniker that it should be content first and devices second. Um, we have an, uh, several integration points with MyMCL. MyMCL is it's the social catalog that we uh, launched around the same time as uh, this the new public website. And what it does is it allows people to, uh, to log in with their uh, library card or library account, because uh, you can now associate a username to that library card in my, in my MCL. And whenever you log into there, you have this option to go in and find books that you want to add to shelves, either for read later, or I'm reading this currently, or I'm, I'm gonna, I want to check this out right now. And you can kind of pull together a list that you're going to check out and then check them out all at once. Um, or put them on hold all at once, because you would, wouldn't really check them out until you got to the library branch. But it's, it's a pretty cool tool. It also allows you to do things like ratings and, and comments and some of these other things. We're really good about privacy of patrons. Uh, just about everything is opt-in if you want to do this sort of thing. Um, but it's really powerful because what we're seeing now is people are actually sharing a lot of book information with each other. The UI isn't quite as great as something like Goodreads, um, but it, it's, it's pretty impressive. So um, quick screenshot there of the library homepage. Uh, whenever we built the library homepage, uh, we took a lot of flack for being very bold uh, with a couple of our decisions. One. We know what you do at the library. You search. It's just used to we had this tiny little search box up in the top right-hand corner. Um, now it's kind of front and center, um, and it is integrated. Um, the uh, menuing system is pretty straightforward, except for that, uh, that, that word grow. By the way, if you ever click on the word grow, it, it's talking about audiences, because we want to grow your children and your adults and your seniors. I still haven't figured it out. Um, and if Jeremy's watching this, uh, He's going he's gonna to give me flack back because he's the one who picked it. Uh, and then we highlight a few things that are happening at the library. Um, I mentioned that there's over 23,000 visits uh, per day. To reach that kind of visits per day, you have two options. You can either throw a lot of hardware at it, or you can figure out how to optimize the heck out of it. Um, we may end up throwing a lot of hardware at it at some point. If we ever decide we want to do, like, say, an integrated login where you're spending a lot of time in Drupal authenticated. Right now, we pretty much shunt people off to the MyMCL um, environment when they're logged in, and they kind of experience that logged environment. So what I'm going to be talking about is more on the side of our events and our events planning, the pages of the site, the blogging that our librarians do, the topical pages, links to resources, those sorts of things that you don't have to be logged in to access it. Um, and we can give you a, lot, a really rich experience, but we can optimize the heck out of it. Um, by the way, uh, 23,000 visits today. Another cool statistic about uh, the Multnomah County Library System. So it's right here in Portland. As a matter of fact, I biked to work today uh, over at the Central Library Building, which is about, I actually don't know which direction. I'm in. It's about two blocks that way. If you, if you haven't been there yet, you're from out of town, please visit it. It's an amazing building. And uh, as far as our buildings within the systems go, it's one of the more um, um, structurally uh, interesting. It's got a lot of cool uh, old mosaic type stuff and um, marble. And it feels like a really fancy library should. Um, that library system, though, the, and the 19 other uh, branches that exist around the system, um, second largest circulation in the country, behind only the New York public library system. So we basically move a library the size of, I always forget which one it is. I can't remember if it's Belmont or Midland, which are two very different sized libraries. But we move a library a day around the system. So I used to work for Innovative Interfaces. Yes. Uh, yes. And we used to use Multnomah County and King County as stress tests hmm. for the library system, which runs the catalog and everything. So yeah, very high circulations. Guys and Harry Potter, you know, holds on Harry Potter and candidates from Multnomah County. Awesome. Okay, we're good to show. 
<laughs> nice, nice, yeah. And, and we've been, we've been, actually I will say that we've also been the result of a stress test that didn't work a time or two. And whenever we found out in the, the end, it was like, oh wow, that, that's really, yeah, I, no, no. But it, it's pretty amazing what goes through that library system. Oh, the total circulation count? It's, it's they have remarkable circulation stats. It's, I mean, this I want to is an incredibly literate count. I, I can get you that information. I'll, I'll post it back out and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share what it is. We're but We, we have uh, sharing agreements with the other regional libraries. So if you have a Multnomah County library card, you can use that card in Washington County or in uh, Clark County over in oh. Vancouver, also in Clackamas County. Um, but they have their own website. They have their own separate collections. So it, even if you're checking out something from one of those collections, um, we're not even counting those checkouts and what we call our circulation. Um, it, it's, it's a pretty phenomenal number of books and media and everything else that goes through that system. Uh, in the past year, actually, we just surpassed total door count is, uh, so the number of people walking through our doors each day uh, just for the first time ever dip below, and I, maybe I shouldn't say dip below because it's still been growing, the uh, website traffic increased above um, our total door count uh, over the past year, which is pretty phenomenal because we've got lots of people coming into our doors on a daily basis. Um, and our facilities people have to struggle mightily to, 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 to hold all that up. Um, so how do you get to that level of optimization? Uh, I'm going to talk about a few different projects that, that we're using actively on the site. Uh, one, we use APC, or Alternative PHP Cache. And basically what that does, it's a, it's a PICO library. It's optimizing the heck out of um, PHP code that you regularly execute, and it's storing it in a lower memory so that it can get back to it uh, more quickly. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a handy thing. It, uh, you, you notice down there, if you were using like a Drupal site where you've implemented it correctly, you might get as much th as three times more performance out of it. So um, just by turning on APC, you can, you can save yourself uh, a lot of performance optimization uh, time. And, and configuration-wise, it's, it's pretty much download the package, enable it, um, and it goes to town and starts doing its work. Another thing we do is we varnish everything. Uh, varnish cache is, it, it, you call it a, a web application accelerator. What it's basically doing is it's taking all of uh, your code that's coming out of the web server out of Apache, and it's caching it as a static page to be delivered up. So if I have a page that's constructed from the database, like say our events listings page, which is gonna have lots of data that changes, but it doesn't change so frequently that I can't afford to cache it for like say five minutes or 10 minutes at a time, it creates an HTML version of that, and whenever that PHP page is requested, it serves up that HTML version instead. So instead of hitting PHP and hitting the database, I'm just hitting the web, uh, web layer. And so it's doing that reverse proxy and, and delivering that off. Um, you can get huge performance gains out of Varnish. Um, if, if you don't have to worry about whether or not somebody is logged in, and there's actually some techniques coming up that may allow for varnishing only parts of your page so that you could kind of reduce load uh, but still deliver dynamic parts like, hi, Josh. You know, hi, Josh actually costs a lot in the web world because you have to hit the database to know it's me. Uh, you have to have a session cookie and you have to maintain that for just me. Well, if I have 23,000 visitors all hitting the site within a 12-hour time span, um, that's, that's a lot of hits to the database. And you know, I could, as I said, I could solve it by throwing a lot of server power at it. But if you opti in order to optimize it, you pretty much have to say, well, I'm not going to give you something personalized. Or you have to make that personalized piece something that's asynchronous via Ajax or some other call so that you can make just that part of the page not cached. Um, Huge performance increases, 300 to 1,000 times. Uh, we've definitely uh, seen that happen with some of our implementations of it. So I mentioned that we kind of use Apache, but not really. So I talked about Apache really delivers to Varnish. Varnish varnishes it and pushes it through. One of the problems we had with Varnish, though, is Varnish's support of HTTPS is marginal at best. 
And the library is very serious about patron privacy, and one of the ways that we want to be serious about that is we don't want people to be able to just arbitrarily track what a patron is uh, perusing on our site. Um, so it came down to us that we were going to deliver the entire site over SSL. In order to do that, though, the load on Apache goes way up whenever you switch over to SSL. So you're, you're, you're talking about, OK, well, we just did all these performance improvements. Suddenly, Varnish doesn't do so great, and we still need to deliver it over SSL. What do we do? Well, it turns out Nginx has a solution for this. Um, it can basically take that reverse proxied information, and it can still deliver it over HTTPS. And it even does a little more caching at its layer. Um, so basically, I said, we cache, we cache, and we cache again. And we're delivering it up with a very lightweight, uh, super performant uh, HTTP engine on the end. Um, Netflix is using Nginx. WordPress.com is using Nginx. Uh, there's some, some great work uh, being done with this particular product. So what do we get for all that uh, optimization? Well, we're running the entire thing on Amazon EC2 large instance. Well, OK, we're running it on a large instance plus a large uh, relational database server instance, because we've got the database off on another, uh, another server. Um, but neither of those are particularly big. It's in, in terms of the application layer, not the database layer, it's all on a box with two CPUs, four compute units in Amazon's terms, um, and about seven and a half gigs of memory. Pardon? This is the library site specific. Yeah. And it's running at about 80% um, most of the time. Um, optimized, just about perfect. I, and I say running at about 80%. 80, 80 it hit, hits 80% most days. Um, we don't have any additional load balancing that we've set up so that it does auto scaling. Uh, so we went with a size where it could just kind of handle it. And what we're seeing is that the fluctuation isn't so huge that we need to do auto scaling at this time because our traffic is fairly predictable. Um, now, that's uh, obviously, that's a, that's a pretty cheap server. We're talking about a 173 bucks a month, uh, roughly. Um, if you added in the RDS server, which we actually do share between a couple of sites, uh, and our solar search server, which we share between a couple of sites, yeah, maybe 200 bucks a month uh, to, uh, to build a site that delivers to uh, 23,000 visitors per day. 23,000 pretty hungry visitors who hit quite a few pages of our site each time they visit, too. So. Um, it's quite a bit of quite a bit of traffic. Oh, and by the way, we are the number we're number fifteen thousand two hundred seventeen. Woohoo! Uh, which sounds really unimpressive until you consider that there's four hundred thirty million websites in the U.S. And I, I use the U.S. number because we're like forty one thousand something globally, um, but it doesn't sound as cool. Um, so. And for anybody who is going to quote the 8,000 stat, we apparently went down, because we were at something like 8,900 uh, uh, a little while ago, which is funny, because our traffic's been going up, and our ranking went down, which means somebody else is popular out there. That's all I can go with. Um, librarians are rock stars. Uh, a few more things we've got going there. We have about 40 librarians that are uh, actively populating the site with blog posts. Uh, they're curating resources uh, for people to use. Um, they're uh, participating on uh, populating what we call our topic pages. Um, and our topic pages basically tie together like, I'm interested in arts. Well, they pull together uh, lots of arts information through our taxonomy system. Um, they all access the site through LDAP integration. So uh, we have you know, county active directory servers that present uh, an LDAP proxy to us. Um, and we do all of our authentication at that. Um, that's really nice because it means they don't have to remember another password. It also gives us some security options in terms of expiration and just making sure that uh, somebody who's not supposed to be in doesn't get in. Um, there are about 11,000 nodes in the CMS proper right now. So within Drupal, we have about 11,000 pieces of content, anything from a, an event to a page to a blog post, what have you. Um, it's categorized nine ways to Sunday. That's, that's something that. Um, we're really proud of because almost the entire site, you know, we're doing all this caching. One of the reasons why we're doing all the caching is because when a library puts something in, they just put it into the system and then they categorize it by location and by audience and by topic, uh, by language if that's appropriate, if it's a resource, by resource type. So is it a 
um, newspaper archive versus a, um, a journal archive, that sort of thing. So if I wanted to go look at newspapers, I can look for newspaper archives. I want to go look for journals, I can go look for journal archives. We, we've got a lot of that kind of stuff classified in there. So when they put the item in, they just classify it, and then it automatically shows up where it's supposed to across the site. It's a really cool taxonomy system, but it's very database intensive because everything in the site is categorized. Um, and so that's a big reason for the, the optimization things that we do as well. It's also really cool for the librarians because they can, they can build really cool stuff with it. Um, integrated site search. This is where we bring solar into play, but we also hit our uh, catalog system, um, which is, you mentioned innovative inter interfaces. So Millennium is the, the system that is kind of our um, OPAC. And I always forget what the O is. It's something... Online public access. Online. There we go. Online public access catalog. So uh, it's, it's where all the records about these are the books that we have, uh, this is what location they're at, whether or not they're currently checked out, uh, how many times they've been checked out historically. I mean, like, we store an enormous amount of data in that system. Um, it used to serve up uh, the primary catalog interface, but um, we wanted to add that social layer in, and that's where MyMCL came into play. Uh, Biblio Commons is a company out of Ottawa, Canada that basically uses a layer I can't think of a better way to describe it, but I mean, they more or less screen scrape the catalog, pull it into their own system, and then... So um, my question, Yai doesn't have an API yet. I mean, no, they, they so scrape you, the you entire know. thing. Okay. Yeah, so if you could imagine the amount of server power that we have to throw at the server that is getting scraped constantly in order to populate the thing that you guys actually participate with, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, so we have that, that Biblio Commons MyMCL layer that we've, we've, we've put in there. It does have an API, which is awesome because what it means is when we pass a search term to our search page, we can actually search our catalog and pull back keyword searches alongside our site search. And the way that looks is that it's literally side by side. So if I search for the term computers, I'm going to see books, movie, mu movies, music, and more, and all of those items. It's basically an API call, and I'm pulling back a marginally cached uh, API call, because what <laughs> Harry Potter is a test. Actually, m two of my favorite top 10 search terms, Canada, <laughs> wh wh why Canada? And Pokemon, we've got this kid who I swear has to be hitting the server daily with hundreds of thousands of Pokemon requests. Okay, hundreds of thousands, an exaggeration, but it's a lot. It's enough that it shows up in our top 10 and you've heard about our circulation, so. Um, <laughs> But at the same time that we're showing those things, we're also showing all the services, the events, the resources. So you just searched on computers. I know you're going to look for a book of computers for dummies or whatever it is. Well, hey, we, we have a class where we teach people computer basics. And you can now meet the computer and more. And you can see that we offer that at the same time, which was a really powerful thing for us to add to the site. Apache Solar is doing that site, that, that right-hand side that's all about what's on the site. And the cool thing with Apache Solar is we've been able to basically custom define our search index. We've got stop words in there that it ignores. We've got elevated words that it will treat a little bit higher because maybe it's a term that's very specific to the library. Stacy, help me out. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Oh, no is not a word. Yeah, I, I, well, we, 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 didn't, we didn't stop word it. We should have. Um, I'd be really mean to that poor kid who's <laughs> looking for those Pokemon comic books. Um, I, I'm trying to think of one, like summer reading, yeah. you know, something like that. We wanted, if you, if you type the word summer or summer reading, we want our summer reading program to be the very first result. Well, we can, you know, we can basically game the system so that our most important things for our site actually show up when you use the terms that you're most likely going to use. And so that was a big thing that we did. It, of course, supports stemming and, and all the things that uh, takes the ING and either adds it or takes it off so that if I type the word running, it's also going to give me results for run, that sort of thing. Um, but it's a really powerful search engine, very, very customizable. We're actually using a single solar server that we use for several of our sites. Uh, it's called uh, multi-core version of solar, which means that we have configuration files for each of those sites, but we're using the same indexing engine underneath which gives us a lot of return on investment because solar is not a terribly expensive server to run. Um, and so running a whole bunch of indexes, indexes off the same one is uh, pretty easy to do. Eight hundred events per month. This takes some work. You got 
19 locations that are picking from a list of about 600 programs. Of that 600 programs, maybe 40 or so are featured programs that we're only going to have for the next three months. This information is shared out with staff at all the different locations. They log into a centralized system. They say, I want a particular uh, event for Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and 3 o'clock. They hit submit, but it doesn't automatically publish. It then gets reviewed so that we can make sure that we actually have a performer who's available for those times. Um, all of that gets kind of hashed out on the back end. Then they, uh, they say, yes, publish this, and we automatically synchronize it up to the public site. We also have a simple registration system built in. But I love this one. It's a registration system where you don't have to create an account. All we ask for is an email address or a phone number, or a phone number, which means for a fair number of our users, if you're taking a how to use email class, which we offer because we're the library and we serve everyone on all ends of the spectrum, um, how to use email class, it doesn't do a lot of good to ask somebody to give you the email address as a part of the registration process. So you can literally go in and register as Charlie Brown uh, with a valid phone number and we'll add you to the list. Please don't do that because you're taking away from someone else and that's bad. Um, it's also very performant, so we can handle quite a bit of scale if somebody tried to, to game that particular system. Uh, but it also uh, res reserves a certain number of seats as well, so you would only be able to do it until you ran out of seats. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, the whole thing is based off services. We're actually using REST uh, to pass things back and forth, which is, which is pretty powerful. Um, the simple registration tool um, because we've cached everything, remember how I talked about you cache everything, you can't give anything personal to someone. Um, I can't tell you that you just registered for it if it's cached, right? So what we did instead is we popped in a little Ajaxy, uh, little JavaScript widget that actually pulls in the information that you just submitted and shows just that part of the page unoptimized, uncached. Everything else on the page is cached and is running that way. Uh, a couple little screenshots here. This is uh, that, that kind of dashboard for the events planner that I was talking about with our bunch of little buttons that we've got going there. It almost looks like a mobile app. Uh, it's actually not terribly mobile optimized because a lot of the calendaring stuff we're dealing with is involving large tables that we show to our staff. It is mobile optimized on the output. Um, but you can see the types of things we do. We you know, request by performers. It handles the invoicing for all those performers that might put on a puppet show or uh, magic jousting or the dog and pony show. We actually have a dog and pony show at the library. Um, it, it's offered quarterly. Um, I, I mentioned to you that it's, it's really complex to set up this stuff across the entire system. So we have a very, you know, you're, you're picking the location, you're picking minimums, maximums, you may be turning on registration, adding multiple role, rows worth of request information that then gets turned into the actual event nodes in the end. Really, really complex, super programming. Um, 90% of which was done by Bob Tchaikovsky, who is an awesome developer. I'm giving him some props. Um, and I could give props to my whole team, but that was amazing. Um, responsive design. Um, and actually, I have to give a lot of props to like Stacy and James and uh, the kind of the front end development of si side of things on our site. Uh, we took a lot of effort to make it so that you can do the entire experience of the Multnomah County Library from just about any device. Now, there's always devices you're going to find that are an edge case that we weren't able to test for. Uh, but we've hit a lot, of, uh, a lot of different designs with our responsive um, design approach. Um, every piece of content was rewritten on the site with the mindfulness of what's the most important thing to list first and then work its way down. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a, a pretty powerful way to change the site. That has nothing to do with the performance or the platform or the technology used. It has everything to do with the people time it takes to build a really cool website. Um, and we certainly put a lot of that into it. I've got a couple of quick screenshots there so you can kind of see the phone versus the tablet. And earlier you had seen the screenshot with you know, the four across. It kind of stacks and automatically adjusts, adjusts to it. You can slide it with a browser, but who does that? Um, that's, that's about it for that slide. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We used the adaptive theme, and uh, we probably would not 
as our base that we then kind of riffed off of. We ended up tearing out so much of it that it barely represents the adaptive theme anymore. Um, I would say that if we were doing it again, which we will be very shortly, uh, upgrading a site that was on Drupal 6 that we're upgrading to Drupal 7, uh, we're going to move to a uh, Compass and SAS based uh, uh, theme. So basically write our own custom theme, keep as thin as light as possible. And Compass and SAS are a couple tools that can be used for creating object-oriented CSS um, and then outputting that into a uh, minified, uh, super tight and compact uh, format. What's that? Don't use Omega. Don't use Omega, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna judge any of the themes. They all have flaws, which is why we're gonna end up building our own. Um, we've, it, it took a while, because over that three and a half years, we had people who started with Drupal with that first site. And so they've been kind of learning best practices along the way, and every site we do is a little bit better, and every site we're, we're like, oh, well, we'll do that on our own the next time. Um, and I think theming is one of those layers where if you can do your own theming, you can really lighten it up quite a bit. Uh, what's next? We do have some things planned for the library website that are coming um, in the very near future. I can't give you a date yet because it's going to take a while to migrate in all the content that just got delivered to us. But we're doing native translations for five different or four different target languages in addition to English, Spanish, Russian, Vietnamese, and Chinese. And that's because we have significant populations of all those languages here in Portland. Um, and of course, we're the library, so we're trying to deliver the people who most need our books and services. And in many cases, they need it in their native language. Um, we do right now pass on a lot of this, uh, a lot of our site, um, like specific parts of our site are translated right now, but not the entire thing. And this is going to represent a fairly, fairly larger effort to translate pretty much everything that you would even care about if you're a native Spanish speaker or Russian speaker or uh, Chinese or Vietnamese. Uh, we're looking at doing an integrated login system, which would possibly mean giving up on some of our caching or getting creative about how we do uh, the bits and pieces of the site that shouldn't be cached. Uh, we're going to do a really cool homework center in the very near future. I'm excited about this. We're big with kids. Don't know if you knew that, but we are. Um, we're also uh, working on a virtual librarian program that um, I don't have a lot of details to share yet, but suffice it to say, we're going to be doing some things that um, no other library has really done before and I think uh, is going to be um, an exciting place for the library to be in the next few years. And I, I, I talk about some of those things. I can't really take credit those because we have a, a phenomenal marketing group uh, within the Multnomah County Library um, that it's their responsibility to, to, to set forth these priorities. Woo, my team, I, I guess I can't hold my heart without causing troubles there. Um, my team, we're focused on uh, development and, and really pushing that forward. So this is the conclusion of my structured presentation. I hope I've filled your head with tons and tons of information. Questions? Yes. So um, I know that your CIO is highly open source positive. You are open source positive. Uh, you are a small, it's a good thing. Yeah. Well, um, I'm library positive. Can you tell? <clears throat> There's budget constraints, and they're like, I have a really good idea how much it costs to run Millennium. Are there plans for to uh, run some sort of ROI or profit loss on switching to Evergreen or Koha, which are open source library uh, cataloging systems? Yeah, we, we've looked at them. Uh, the biggest reason why we haven't uh, pursued a switch uh, actively, we are, are actually going to do the Millennium to Sierra upgrade, which means. Good luck. <laughs> believe me. But we, we actually moved it to that new hardware on Monday, and the, the site was crazy for a whole day. Unfortunately, we're on, on track for, I think, September. But, um, no, that's four months. There we go, September. Um, so the, 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 in answer to the question about Evergreen or Koha, our, both of those are phenomenal projects, and we are keeping a very close eye on them. We love what Seattle Public is doing with Evergreen in particular, and of the two, we think that one probably has the better chance to be performant enough in the long term to be able to reach what we're talking about, because Seattle's a fairly large library as well. Though Seattle is a city library versus a regional library like Multnomah, so we actually have a larger base than they do even. So the amount of performance... Has King County moved it to Evergreen as a whole now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well... They crashed Innovative when they went live, so they are a considerable system. 
I, I will say then that it is uh, very possible that we'll be looking at it. I, I'm, I'm part of the team that makes that decision, but we have so many people involved in our integrated library system because it touches every part of the business from circulation to, um, to actually buying the books and putting them on the shelves and uh, then making sure that they get out to the various libraries. Um, it, it would definitely be considered. Um, there is some advantage to having somebody to point a finger to, um, though I'll admit whenever it comes to patrons, they're always going to point the finger back to the library as a whole. So uh, we're, we're, we're looking at it, but it's not been quite there yet. Uh, that's something that Multnomah County can't afford to be an early adopter on, unfortunately. Yes. Evergreen in particular, well, Cohan in particular, but Evergreen has a very high cost of uh, maintenance right now. Yeah. And so you have to have staffing for it. Yeah. yeah. And it's significant. You know, I started with a team of five doing uh, our Drupal development. We're up to, I'm going to say, 10 that are dedicated to Drupal. Um, and then I have another two that. That's a big Drupal shop. It's a pretty good sized Drupal shop. I mean, we, we are a, a county that uh, serves, what is it, uh, 750,000 citizens. Uh, and my team actually serves all of the county. So we build all county sites, not just the library site. Just obviously this one took a bit more optimization and customization than some of the others. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's 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 been the biggest impact. The, the question was, you know, how do how do you grow that quickly uh, from three to ten, and how do you get that kind of support within an organization that over that time period was actually doing cuts? This is the first year in like seven years that the library, or I'm sorry, that the county has not had significant cuts to the budget. Um, we've lost people every year, and it's it's been a restructuring process. But during that restructuring process, we also we changed in a lot of ways. It wasn't just implementing Drupal. At the same time, we impl implemented Google Apps for government. So Multnomah County has been on the cutting edge of a couple other things that has forced kind of wholesale transformations of IT. And it, it's very much meant shifting positions from one area to another and, and kind of balancing the, all that out. Um, it, definitely the successes of the group have led to a certain amount of growth. Um, th there's a certain limit to that, too, though. Uh, we've tried to consolidate more and more of the web properties that used to be on other technologies uh, into Drupal. Um, if, it, if it's a forward-facing web property, our, our general uh, approach is this. We look for software as a service first, because we'd rather pay somebody else a fair price to do it for us, particularly if it's a good price. I mean, uh, Google, our cost per license in the end, whenever you factor even in the support people and everything else that we have added into our Google cost, it's only about 100 $117 per user um, that we end up charging out um, from a central group. Um, and, and considering that, the, you know, of that $117, $40 uh, of that is the actual straight Drupal licensing cost, and the rest of it is the overhead of, I'm sorry, not Drupal, Google licensing cost. Um, and everything else is just kind of the overhead of providing that service. Uh, that's still pretty impressive. I mean, $117 per user per year. We're not talking about huge amounts there. Um, so we first look for software as a service. If we can't find something software as a service, the next thing that we look for is, is there something that's out of the box that we can do uh, with a, a minimum amount of customization? And Drupal fits that a lot of times because we're able to do a minimal amount of customization to create something that's publicly facing. It's a web property. Um, and then if we really have to go the route of custom development, uh, we actually have a pretty extensive .NET and uh, My Microsoft SQL uh, development group. I, I wish we could. I, this is me speaking personally, not me speaking for the county. I wish we had more open source development on the custom level as well. Um, the completely custom. We do a lot of custom stuff with Drupal. So. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, it's going to be hard for me to, to summarize that for the, uh, the, the taping, but um, basically what is the, the, the decision-making process for uh, when would we choose Drupal over another solution, when would we choose customization, and actually how big is the purview of the group that is responsible for Drupal. Um, it's enterprise and web applications. So we have, as I said, Google Apps for Government belongs to my group. I have a dedicated library BSA that just looks at any system for the library and does analysis work for that. And then I have a fairly significant group that does mostly Drupal work. They also do integration work. Um, so sometimes they're writing a little bit of .NET code to integrate with something, or maybe they're uh, writing some services that talk back and forth and we're pulling it from another system. Um, it's no longer a world where you can't have integrated systems. There's, there's got to be some level of pulling data from all of them. And so whenever we're looking at what makes a good Drupal project, um, the things that, that we're primarily looking at is, First, is it a publishing platform? Is it something where we're doing content management of some sort? Because what Drupal's bad at is math. Don't, don't make Drupal do accounting. It doesn't really work. But it's great at publishing. And it gives you really great flexibility and workflows for that sort of thing. And so if we have a workflow type application or a publishing type application, we absolutely look at Drupal first. If we have a data warehouse application that's going to need to be integrated with several other state systems and be really locked down and in a very custom environment, that's whenever we start looking at, at, at other solutions. Um, and it's, it's always give and take, and sometimes it's availability. Sometimes my team is booked out, and it has to be built on another platform, and that's just how it works. So I wish I could say it was one thing, but it's, it's a little bit more organic than that. I think I've hit my time. Um, Thank you all, and I'll, I'll be around for maybe another five, 10 minutes or so if, uh, if you guys have uh, any additional questions. Thanks.